<laughs> Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And uh, to be honest, I really hoped that we were going to make it to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 tonight. But we're not quite there yet. And uh, so talking about the love of Christ, it comes from this basic idea that... Uh, Understanding that God loves us demands a response. Understanding that God loves us demands a response. Understanding that uh, the depth of God's love demands a sacrifice. Okay, And the pursuit of God's love gives us knowledge that is past knowledge. And that's where we've come to get to this point. And, and so that's really have been dealing with a lot of the internal thing. I recognize I love him because he first loved me. I, I respond to his love. When I understand the depth of his love, I begin to sacrifice uh, my heart to, for him. And I begin to desire to serve him. And then when I uh, see the reality, uh, the knowledge of his love grows. It gives me, uh, through this inner man, through the strength of the spirit, in Ephesians chapter number 3, knowledge beyond knowledge, to know the love of Christ. And it creates this circle. The more that I understand his love for me, the more it creates in me a love for him. The more I understand he loves me, the more it creates my love for him. And so that love will begin to impact not just my heart's knowledge of him, but it will also begin to impact my life, the way I operate and uh, if we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word, if you're able, as we read the Word of God, to honor the Word of God, it says this, let's go all the way back and begin in verse number 6. Verse number 6, we'll start at the therefore, uh, verse number 6, and we'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. The Bible says this, Therefore, are we always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord? For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, they that which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know, uh, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now therefore know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that You'd help us as we look at these verses, that You would illuminate to us the truth, Lord, give us uh, the knowledge that we need, Lord, but help us apply it to our heart and our life. Might we be different because of the preaching of Your Word, Lord. May we make decisions tonight based upon 
our response to your spirit's working in our heart and life this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. One of the most well-known passages of Scripture, of course, is 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And that is a wonderful verse, and there is many applications to that. But it is very important for us to make sure that we first and foremost apply it to the passage that is written in. And the context by which it's written in and, and, and what it is talking about uh, really is helping us understand how to live this life by faith and what that faith will therefore produce in our life. And the means of its production is through the love of Christ. If you go all the way back to verse number 7, it talks about this idea that we, we don't know these things by sight. It says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are not in the presence of the Lord. He even goes on to tell us, we, don't know, we know no man after the flesh. Even though we knew Christ after the flesh, we know him no more after the flesh. You, you're not seeing Christ in the flesh. Uh, he is you having to trust in the word of God and response to the spirit of God. You do not have Christ in the flesh. And so he's explaining here, he says, we walk by faith, but we have the confidence as if we could see it because of the faith of God. And we know that there's going to be an accountability because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to stand there and give that account. Knowing this, we persuade men. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And, and he's talking about his persuasion of them. And now look what it says here in verse number 12. For we command not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we uh, be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He says, listen, we have this confidence. We know we're all given account. Our confidence is not based in sight. Our confidence is not based in presence. Our confidence is based in faith. Uh, we know even by faith to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we will give an account for these things. And we want you to have the understanding of this. Why? What's your motivation for doing this, Paul? What's your motivation for having this confidence and knowing the love of Christ that you would give of yourselves to others? He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. So we live by faith. Living by faith produces in us an ambassadorship where we are willing to persuade others and we become having the spirit of reconciliation. The bridge between those two, and this is borne out in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. If you have all faith, if you speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, ye are nothing. So he says, we live and are confident by faith. We are ultimately ambassadors involved in the spirit of reconciliation. What is the thing that bridges our faith and our activity? It's the love of Christ. The love of Christ is what bridges our faith and activity. And in fact, it tells us this. It says this in verse uh, number 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Okay? And now, I've done some research on this word, and the word literally means to press in. It means to press in where you would take, and you would take that, uh, that cattle when you're leading it to the slaughter, and it would be in a large pen, and, and as you begin to funnel that cattle, it would get more narrow and more narrow and more narrow, to where eventually there's no room for that cattle to deviate other than the path that has been given to it. And that's the idea of constraint. And I was trying to think of an illustration of that, and, and uh, I was thinking about that, and my son brought these binoculars yesterday, Truman. And this is really a picture of the idea of what I think of constraining. Because it's hard for us to get an understanding of what it means to be constrained because we immediately think about what is outside the constraints. 
In order to constrain, you have to keep out. That's not really the idea. Constraining is being kept in because there's a goal, there's a purpose. What ultimately is the purpose? Well, let's go to verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, what are we talking about these new things? And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we often will take these verses and apply it and get the bad stuff out of your life. Love God, get the bad stuff out of your life. Think less of that. Think less of focusing on, okay, I love God, so i got to remove this and remove this and remove this. Think more of this when you look through the binoculars. Something that would be difficult to see in the distance becomes more clear. And when you look through these binoculars, you're not going, boy, Brother Omar's in my line of sight. I really need to move Brother Omar because he's in my line of sight. Boy, John Minton's messing this up. In fact, in order for Brother Omar and Brother John to become a problem for me, I must deviate from what I'm looking at and the plan that I have and the constraining factor of this. Isn't it amazing you ever look through a scope or binoculars? I don't know why you would be looking through a scope. Maybe you can bring home some deer meat or something. But you're looking through a scope? That doesn't work, does it? It just doesn't work that way. In order for it to be able to, to operate properly, everything else must be taken out of the equation. And it's amazing when that constraining factor of those, uh, that scope comes into play, not only is there not an idea of, look at all the stuff that I'm avoiding, it's the picture becomes very clear. The picture becomes very clear. What is the goal? Well, it tells us this. I'm going to be a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And what area is this going to be lived out in my life? Well, he tells us this. We'll have the spirit uh, or the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling us to the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now think about that verse for a minute. He says, God had taken the, the, the reconciliation and put it in Christ. You know what Christ was doing every, while he was on this earth? You know where his ultimate focus was? The cross. The cross. His focus ultimately was the cross. Because that would be the place where the transaction would happen, where he would become sins for the mankind, and therefore that ministry or that reconciliation could take place. And you read the Gospels and how he has set his face uh, to go towards Jerusalem and how he said, I must go up towards Jerusalem. And always is the idea of going towards the cross. That is the ministry. He said, I'm about my father's business. That's why I'm here, my father's business. And all these other things that would bother everybody else didn't seem to bother Jesus. The fact that he had no place to lay his head. The fact that when he preached the message, more people left the church than came. Isn't that interesting? And in fact, when a lot of people started coming, he said, oh, let me give you a hard saying. And he would give them a hard saying and many would go home and follow him no more. Didn't seem to bother Jesus. You know why? His focus was ultimately on the accomplishment of reconciliation. Reconciling man back to God. He says, just like that was Christ, God in Christ with the reconciliation he says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray, you in Christ dead, be ye reconciled to God. He said, when you take the lens of God's love, and you put it up, and you're constrained, boy, we struggle with a lot of things, and the problem is, really is not our inability to have victory. The problem is there's not enough focus on looking through the love of Christ. When you look through the love of Christ, boy, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see the need for reconciliation. 
Think about it this way. I use my wife as an illustration often. I'm not going to make her come up here tonight. Aren't you glad? And before we got married, before we got married, can I tell you, there is all this worry and thoughts about, you know, who are you going to marry? And not so much for me, perhaps, but, you know, for a lot of people, it's who are you going to marry? And they look with this real wide lens, don't they? They got this wide, wide lens, okay? And they see of all these individuals, And then God lays some person on your heart, hopefully you do it in a biblical way, and God lays some person on your heart, and you begin to love them. Isn't it amazing you don't have to try to filter out everybody else? It just happens. And everybody else seems to be filtered out. And once that love is created and you begin to, to pursue that, and boy, you're looking forward to a day, aren't you? You're looking forward to a day. I did not understand those things before uh, I began to love my wife. If you'd asked me, of course I got married when I was 20 years old, but if you'd asked me when I was 18, 19 years old, so when are you going to get married? I don't know. I don't care. I didn't care. It didn't bother me none. Get married at 20 or 50, I, whatever. Didn't care. Man, it was amazing. As I began to be in love with her, we first said, okay, we're going to get married in August. That ended up being a long way away. Long way away. And things began to narrow. All of a sudden, it went from August all the way back to May. Boy, things began to narrow. We got married in May, right? Yeah, uh, all the way back, she's shaking her head like, no. <laughs> and it was amazing. Before, the things that I would not have any understanding of, love took and it narrowed that focus. Now, I became a different creature, really, to be honest with you. My love for her changed who I was, okay? As the love of Christ should change who we are. I'm confident of my salvation. Are you confident of your salvation? I'm confident the moment I take my last breath, I'll be in eternity. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because I have faith in God, I have faith in the word of God, and it tells me these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have everlasting life. I am confident of those things. What a blessing. And I know that one day I will give an account. So what bridges that gap between my faith And my ability to minister and to be an ambassador for Christ. It really is my struggle with how much I'm willing to be constrained by the love of Christ. As I struggle with being an ambassador, as I struggle with perhaps selfishness, as I struggle with pride, I can put whatever category I want to on it. But really, what's happening is I've gone from loving Christ, because when you love Christ, you will be constrained, you will be changed, and you will thus judge. This is what you'll judge. It tells us this in chapter number 5. It says this in verse number uh, 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. So when the love of Christ is constraining you, you you look through the parameters of his love, you'll be able to clearly see, I'm not going to live for myself, I'm not going to honor myself, I'm not going to please myself, I'll be the ambassador of Christ, I'll have the ministry of reconciliation, I have the same goal that he does to bring men from a lost and dying world, to headed for a sinner's hell, to bring him in reconciliation with God. I'm a different person. So why do I struggle with that? I step back from the love of Christ. Now, I say I still love him, but the picture is not as clear from back here. Try hitting a target looking through this scope. The picture is not as nearly as clear. And so we take the knowledge of our faith and compile it with the knowledge of our activity. 
It says you have the ministry of reconciliation. You are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you have the word of reconciliation. This is our activity. Well, that's just the Apostle Paul's. His too and ours. And so we take the activity. I know my faith is strong. So how come somewhere between my faith and my activity, something is not working right. So I'm not having the activity that I know I'm supposed to have. Well, you've stepped back from the love of Christ. It's not constraining you. You could not, therefore then say, we thus judge. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. And those that are living should live unto him, not henceforth unto ourselves, but unto him that died for us. Now, using my wife as an illustration, have you ever seen marriages when they first get married, right? You see them, you say, oh, newlyweds, look at them. Isn't that gross? You know? You look at him like, Ugh. And you know what we say as old cynics? Just you wait. Just you wait. After you've been married a while, you won't act that way anymore. You know, you know what we're really saying? You're going to step back from the love that has constrained you to be a different person. You're going to step back from that love. And you will henceforth live unto yourself instead of the other person. We see that take place sometimes in our life. We see that take place in, in homes and marriages. And we come up with all sorts of reasons why it happens and all sorts of solutions. When really the whole problem is we have become selfish instead of selfless. So how do we fix it? What's the goal? What's the problem? How do we overcome this? He says this. First of all, in order for this to take place, not only do I need to have my faith, but I need to know that there's an end to my faith. He goes back up and he says this in verse number 10. In verse number 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done whether it be good or whether it be bad. Remember, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when we'll see him again. My wife will go away and she'll go to, next month she'll go to the ladies' retreat and it'll be just me and the kids at home. And the most dangerous time is within the first couple hours that she'd left. Because there's no sense of accountability. There's no sense that she's probably not coming back anytime real quick. So whatever happens, we can fix it later. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's really bad when she takes Riley. Ooh. <laughs> That's bad. But the dangerous time or the time that we begin to understand that as we go, wait a second. When's she supposed to be back? She'd come back sometime Saturday afternoon, and we go into hurry mode, right? We start cleaning everything up, and I kind of go into delegation mode, okay? Clean that up, clean that up. We're doing all, because we know that she's coming back, and there's an expectation when she comes back that we want to be th uh, things to be a certain way so that when she can comes in, she can say to us, well done, how good and faithful servants. <laughs> What a blessing. How excited we are when she comes back and it's that. There's been other times she comes back and she goes, really? Really? And we, especially when we I thought we tried. We thought we tried. She comes back, this is the best you got. There's an expectation that's placed upon that. Can I tell you something about appearing before the Lord? His return is intimate. His return is immediate. His return can happen at any moment. So we look forward in expectation of that, not in the distant future, but through the love of Christ as if we could see it at any moment and we live our life in expectation of when we shall present ourselves unto him. And Paul says, listen, 
We labor the way we do. We operate the way we do. We attach our labor to our faith because we know a day's coming. We know a day's coming. And understanding the reality, we don't want to present ourselves simply because we are, want to be uh, held right in judgment. We want to present ourselves properly because we thus judge. If he died for me, I should live for him. But I must attach that to his coming. I must attach that to his appearing. Paul says we attach it to his appearing. Then it tells us this. If you look what it says, we, we attach not only the understanding of that to his appearing, we also attach it to the expectation of the immediacy and the difference in our lives. It says in verse number 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We, act, we understand the expectation of his appearing, but also understand the process of growing. The process of growing. He says, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is the idea that I am learning. And as I begin to focus, I love watching Caden when we're going, we're, we're trying to, to hunt because he's right-handed, but he's left-eye dominant. And I remember trying to get him to close his, close his left eye and look through the scope. And he's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Boy, the aim wasn't there because of that. And there's a process that took place. And now he's got, it's a lot easier for him to shoot left-handed because he can close his right eye. And look, there, there's this whole process that takes place. And we recognize that things are going to be different. Things are supposed to change. It's not supposed to get that the love will wane and grow old in that marriage, but that the, the love will become stronger in our marriage. The same thing as I learned I'm a new creature and old things are passed away. It has this idea. Old things are passed away. Watch as I learn to love Christ more. I learn to love him more. I'm constrained more and more. And as I am constrained more and more, more clearly the picture of his return comes and more distant the view of those things and people that would distract me. Man. Man. Think about it. Literally, it's almost like I'm supposed to walk around with heavenly binoculars on. You say, really? Is it supposed to be that way? Hey, Philippians chapter number 3 tells us this. With heaven in view. I, we do things based upon the knowledge of heaven. Let's turn there. Philippians chapter number 3. Look what it tells us. as It begins to go in verse uh, chapter number 4. Look what it says in uh, chapter number 3. Look what it says beginning in verse number 14. It says, well, let's start in verse number 13. Philippians chapter number 3 beginning in verse number 13. Brethren, I count not myself to as apprehended, but this one thing I know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect and thus minded, and if anything, ye be otherwise mindful that God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto ye have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us uh, mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk also as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be made fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He says, our conversation is in heaven. We mind heavenly things instead of earthly things. How do we do that? Because I don't know about you, I live in this world. I'm constrained by the love of Christ. You ever hear somebody say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Yeah. You met somebody and they introduce, say, hey, this is my wife so-and-so. You spend 30 minutes with them and you think, <clears throat> God bless you, brother. <laughs> 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 I 
They just think she's the most incredible thing in the world. And you're thinking, thank you, Lord. <laughs> that you gave me the wife you gave me. Thank you, Lord. And their wife's thinking, thank you, Lord. <laughs> that you gave the husband. And it is that love that changes the view of that individual. How much more biblical love? The, the right kind of love. And that's why joy, uh, that's why Paul can talk about going through all the affliction and all the trouble. And he says, I count it but a light thing. No problem. In fact, he says this, it all fell out to the glory of the cross. It all fell out to the glory of Christ. He says, I even account all my earthly accomplishment. He lists them all there for us. I count all my earthly accomplishments, but is dung. Why? Because the love of Christ had constrained him so much that he looks beyond the earthly things and sees the heavenly things. Boy, you can live in a life, you can live in a world like we live and have joy if you're constrained by the love of Christ. You can live in the world that we live in and see souls instead of problems when you're constrained by the love of Christ. And what happens is you cannot help but become an ambassador having the spirit of reconciliation. You can't help it. You know why? You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you're constrained. You say, but if I'm constrained, I, I can't see everything. No, but you can see something that nobody else can see. One of my favorite things when I fly is flying over Tampa trying to point out everything. You know, everything looks so much different from above. Looks so much different from above. And you're flying in the Tampa, and you're looking, and you're imagining, hey, we drove on that road to get to the airport, but while you were on that road driving to the airport, all you could see was just right in front of you. But from that distance, you can see everything. Hey, the view is different. And same thing for the Christian that is constrained with the love of Christ. We this judge. We're not going to live for ourselves anymore. We're going to live for him who died for us. And I'll be able to focus in on heaven. Brother John read that verse this morning. Lay up not treasure. Where earth and moth doth corrupt. But where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, how do I do that? How do I get my heart in heaven? How do I set my affections on things above and not on things below? Love of Christ. Love of Christ. Yeah, but preacher, I, I don't feel that way. You know, over the years, I've been able to have the opportunity to do marriage counseling. Somebody comes in, I just don't feel the same way about her as I used to. Yeah, but love is a choice, not a feeling. Beyond that, you're probably more concerned about how you're feeling as opposed to how you're loving. And this is what you tell them. You know what you need to do? You need to get to know them again. You need to spend some time together. You need to spend some time together to get to know them. You say, man, I just don't feel that way. I feel burdened and depressed. I don't see heaven that way. Can I tell you? You need to get to know Jesus. Preacher, I've known Jesus for a long time. You mean like those folks in his hometown when he went back in Mark chapter number 6? And he, they said, is this not Jesus, the, the, the son of Mary and Joseph and the brother? He has, his brothers are here amongst us. And he said, he could do there no mighty work. They were so familiar with Jesus. They had lost their amazement. <coughs> Fall in love with Jesus and let the love of Christ constrain us. What bridges my faith to my actions is the love of Christ. So I check, do I have faith? Friend, if you don't have faith, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step. So then I look at the other side. Then why? what's the problem with my actions? Why am I so self-oriented and selfish and prideful? What? Can I tell you why? You've not been constrained by the love of Christ. If you know him, you will not be able to help but love him. 
If you know him, you will not be able to help but love him. And when you love him, your life will be constrained by that love. And when it's constrained by that love, you take on the ministry of reconciliation, you become a vocal ambassador for Christ, and you carry the word of reconciliation in your heart. We spend a lot of times in our Christian circles doing this. Hey, don't do that. Stop that. Don't do that anymore. That's what a lot of our preaching is about. Stop that. Don't do that. Mm, Really, that's backwards. What we should be doing is fall in love with Jesus Christ. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because when you love him, you'll be constrained. You won't even see those things. All you'll be able to see is heaven. And it's a far more beautiful picture than anything this world can offer. And you will be able to operate in this life in a biblical way if you're viewing the eternal things. Even the temporal things. Go back to Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Even all those things under the sun that are just vanity become eternal. And every act of every single day, you look through the love of Christ. You see heaven, and you operate different. You know, there's something, I had this idea in closing, there's something about representing somebody. There's something about being a representative. The Olympics are coming up in a couple weeks, and I just can't help it. When the Olympics come on, guess who I root for? The Americans. I see that flag. I don't know who it is. I probably don't want to know. But I see the flag and I can't help it. They're mine. It's my country. I root for them. What an incredible privilege to represent. Isn't that an awesome thing? And what a slap in the face of a country when they don't take that uh, with the right consideration with the right respect and they do things that defame the flag in the country and we look like what is their problem get their act together can i remind you we are ambassadors for christ what bridges my faith to my activity is the love of christ let's pray lord i pray that you'd help us lord that we might learn to love you Learn to love you in a way that constrains us, that helps us see heaven, and that we become different people because of that love. Lord, it was a response to that love that first allowed us to have forgiveness of sins and become a Christian as we responded to the love of Christ as he died upon the cross for us. And now we just continue to respond to that love and become ambassadors and have the spirit of reconciliation, Lord, so that we might prepare. Lord, even as we think of our revival coming up this week, Lord, help us to be constrained by your love, setting our affections on things above, setting aside those things that would distract us, and watching our faith become action as it is motivated by love. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name.